Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Voices from Afar. And I am your host, Bill Demarest. And... So tonight we have a very special guest, Leslie Kane, and she wrote the book, Surviving Death. She has documented cases uh, far and wide of people's experience after they leave the body. Uh, I can't call them near-death experiences because my perception of it is it's after-death experiences. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience just so that we can come here to learn whatever is needed to learn to take it on to the next life. I'd like to say hello to Leslie Kane. How are you this evening, Leslie? Hi, Bill. I'm really well, and I'm so happy to be on your show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I brought Star into the studio with me. How are you this evening, Star? Good evening, Bill. Hello, Leslie. Nice to meet you. Glad you're here. And I'm doing well, and I'm ready to hear this. This is interesting few little stories myself maybe so let's get into it and one other co-host with me or one other crew is uh, mr william white crow and he is my shaman and he is very spiritual and we've discussed life after death many times how are you this evening william i'm doing fine looking forward to the show i've uh, done some reading uh, and leslie's material and her research and uh, it's going to be a good show all the way around And and as if you said bill you know, I've, I've had my own de- near-death experiences right in front of my family and once in Vietnam. So uh, I'm looking forward to the show. I'm glad she's here. Okay, Leslie, could you please start by telling us where we can find your book and get right into it? Sure. And I'm just so happy to have your other two people on tonight because um, I'm always interested in hear about hearing about people's experiences. Um, my book is called Surviving Death. And the subtitle is A Journalist Investigates Evidence for an Afterlife. And I'm basically, you know, I I understand that all of you, probably most of your listeners, accept the reality of survival past physical death. And my book was really geared towards people who have not thought that much about it or maybe are skeptical about it and haven't read a lot about it, haven't had experiences themselves. I mean, some, a lot of the readers have, but... I'm also trying to reach an audience of people that are not necessarily open to this. And I'm hoping this book will open people's eyes and open doors for them. So I'm, I'm really providing a lot of very basic evidence that comes, comes from a lot of different sources, pulling it all together into one book, trying to make it as evidential and as, you know, sort of scientific and journalistically sound as possible to reach people really through the intellect, through their minds, as opposed to through direct experiences. And those who have had experiences, of course, I think will find the book very supportive of their experiences, and it gives them a context in which they can put those experiences, and they can also come to understand that there's been research done on these kinds of things, and that other people, many other people, have had the same experiences that they've had. And I also include my own experiences in the book, as well as my research. So that sort of gives you an overview of what my purpose was in writing it. And where can we find your book? Well, I have a website. The URL for the website is Surviving Death Kane. That's my last name, which is spelled K-E-A-N, K-E-A-N. And if you go to that website, there are links. You can buy the book just about anywhere. You can buy it on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles or all the different uh, websites that sell books. Or if you just put the title in Google or put my name in Google, you will definitely find it. But I think most people like to go to Amazon and it's, it's actually at a very low price on Amazon. So it's a good place to get it. Let me ask you, have you run into people that say that, well, when I die, there's nothing there. When I die, it's over. Have have you been able to explain to people that's just not the way it is? Yeah, I mean, there are people who have told me, actually, that they thought like that before they read my book. And now the book has completely, like, turned their worldview upside down and made them really have to think and really have to question, you know, the presumption that death is the end. I mean, I'm not actually saying in the book that I have proof for survival past death, but I'm giving very strong evidence and letting people make up their own minds. And I think by the end of the book, as I said, those that don't believe in it are 
it's pretty hard for them to maintain that position. Let's put it that way. After reading what I, the evidence that's presented in the book. And uh, speaking of evidence, I, I don't know, it was about 15, 20 years ago on a discovery channel. You know, there were so many cases of, of people leaving their bodies and, and saying what went on in that room. Well, there was one experiment set up that a word in LED lights was on top of a locker that you would have to be well above to see it. About 15, 20 years ago, they said to date, no one has come back and told them what the words were. Do you have any documentation of that? Have you heard of this experiment or has there been proof since it came up about 15, 20 years ago? And at that time, they said they've never had anyone tell them what the words on that sign were. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I, it's a really great question. And I know that I've talked to some medical doctors who have set studies up like that, where they've like put something in a hidden location or put something up on the ceiling of the room. And the, the reason that they say it doesn't seem to work is number one, they can't, they don't know in a big, in a hospital, which room the person's even going to end up in. Number two, if they do go out of their bodies and they tend to be up on the ceiling looking down at their own bodies, right? I mean, they tend to be observing what's going on in terms of themselves. And so, you know, they seem to find that, you know, there's nobody that there isn't any reason for them to look up at the ceiling and remember some number up there. It seems like it's not really a feasible experiment or one that, that can work very well. That was my understanding of it anyway. Yeah. William, your near-death experience, could you share that for a moment? Well, I could share part of it, yeah. Um, I, as I just typed in there to our little chat area, you know, she's on it. Because uh, when it happened to me, I was electrocuted by 24,000 volts, 350 amps. Two high-tension uh, power lines were next to our house. We were putting up an antenna, and the guy that's supposed to be watching the top of the antenna, the power lines obviously wasn't. I got hit full blast, and it literally disintegrated the wrench that was in my hand. We never found it. And uh, I knew I was on my way out when I got electrocuted. You know, it was just, I could see the juice going through me. It blew my knees out, my toes out, my fingers. It just melted and blew them out. Everything just curled up, atrophy, flight, like just curled up because the electricity. And I hit the ground and I was in water, you know, a little bit of standing water. So uh, my wife came out, my son was standing right there. And I always taught him, <laughs> bless him, you know, if you ever see a fire, head for water. Well, I was on fire, you know, and uh, he headed straight into the front yard and he had a little five gallon, bu gallon bucket and he jumped in it. You know, he was just a little tight at that time, you know, and my wife came out and all the neighbors come out. I took in all of the electricity in the town of Volta, which is just right outside uh, uh, Los Banos, California, as a matter of fact. When I left, uh, well, you don't know you're leaving, you know, you're just I was above the power lines looking down. That's the first recollection I had. Uh -huh. And I was looking at my body, just like she said. And uh, it was like, okay. Um, and then I immediately thought of my family. Oh, my God. But that went away. I mean, just instantaneously. And next thing I know, I'm in a different different world, a different, shall we say, dimension or whatever you want to call it, you know. It was uh, far beyond anything when one would ever think of heaven, you know, far beyond. It was, was so, it was realer than real. And I was standing on a beach this, this is the interest maybe it's because of the way i was raised as a shaman you know a medicine person and everything and, and the native beliefs and everything but i was sitting on a beach and one side was that red clay that adobe red clay that beautiful color but it was all sand crystalline and then on the other you know about 15 20 feet from the beach was uh that white pure crystalline sand and there was a, just a perfect divide between these and i looked to my left and i seen some trees and three sets of hills a tree on each hill in a different position, like they were raggedy and windblown, and no leaves, no nothing. And then I looked over to the right, and it was just beautiful water, just lapping waves. And you, you, you see the water diamonds, like there's diamonds in the water when it's just hitting the shore in some movies. That's what it looked like. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. everything was just, just perfect on that side. So it was like almost like I had a choice. Uh, but what really stuck me, that's why I, I typed it. And I looked at myself first, my body, and then I seen my family and the neighbors and everybody standing around me. And my wife grabbed me and pulled me. I was I was gone for about ten minutes, and wow. my wife pulled me and straightened me out, you know, and everything got me out from where you know we were working and everything and out of the water. She kept saying, "It's not your time. Come back." And I was I had moved from 
where I was down to the beach and I looked and I seen footprints, but yet I know I had no body. That was unbelievable feeling. Mm. And I was in peace. I'm going to be honest with you. I was in total peace here. I was really not thinking of anything. It was like I knew what was happening for some reason. And I kind of levitated out over the water. And when I was out, heading out a little bit ways, you know, just kind of, I guess you could say looking around, but I was being pulled a direction really, you know, in a sense. Um, I heard it's not, you have to stop. It's not your time yet. And when I came back, it was like falling. There's a lot more to it, you know, but yeah. I'm, I'm giving you a short version. And I started falling back. I went straight. I didn't fall, but I went right back across the water, back to the, to the edge of the beach here. Looked, seeing my footprints as I'm moving backwards right to my same position that I got there in. I watched the footsteps disappear, and then I felt like I was falling off a 50-story building backwards. Whew, that body rush, you know. And then, whew, I woke up real fast. Like my wife said my body just jumped like I jumped back in my body and I had no heartbeat any of that you know uh, I was I was gone and uh, when I woke up it was like let me stand up I have to stand up it's just a survival mode that I go into you know I got to stand up and survey in myself and everything and uh, that's pretty much you know the short version of my experience but that falling I tell you what uh, coming back in it's like traveling thousand miles an hour backwards and then you hit and you come back in your body. It was just amazing. It reminds yeah. me of the Pam Reynolds case. I don't know if you remember in the book, but she described when she was out of her body, um, she didn't want to go back, which is so common, you know. As you say, you're you're at yeah. peace in this beautiful environment. And she um she talks about a family member who actually pushed her, kind of pushed her, forced her to go back. And she described a similar thing that she was like falling, and then she mm-hmm. suddenly like landed with this big you know, kind of thud in her body and her body was, they were at that point trying to start her heart again, but she described it as a very unpleasant experience to have to oh, yeah. back in. Yeah, definitely. Very unpleasant. <laughs> definitely it is. It's, yeah. it's a rush. Uh, that's about the best way you can put it. And so many people say they don't want to come back. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I, I came back and I'm glad I did because of my family. You know, I look at it now, but there's still a longing way back in the back there that when death comes, I'm not going to fight it at all. Uh, you know, I, I'm i totally not afraid of death. And, and um, when it happens, I guess it's just a good day to die. Best way to put it. That's how the Native Americans used to say it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. my belief, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really a, a, an incredible story. I really appreciate hearing it. And that's why I yeah, asked you. Thank you for letting me tell it. Yeah, and that, that's why I asked him to share it, because I'm sure that you have, you know, similar case histories. Is the most interesting case history you came across the child that claimed he was the pilot that got killed in a war? I mean, that certainly was one of them. That one and the, the child, Ryan Hammonds, who was a, an actor in Hollywood. They're both, to me, very compelling cases, largely because the children were so young and because all their memories were, were verified as accurate. So it's very hard to explain how they could have had those memories that could be proven to be accurate and, you know, memories of the life of someone who had died decades before they were born and someone to which their families had no connection at all, just a complete, you know, no connection. And yet the child not only remembered specific facts, both these children and and other children too, but they also kind of relived a lot of it and had nightmares about their previous death and would play act uh, things from the previous life. And they had a lot of emotion around the whole thing. So it was a lot more than just memories. Uh, Really, really impacted their lives dramatically. They often had, then they had some kind of experience that kind of resolved it for them, which is often what happens with these kids, whether it be going back to the previous house they lived in or meeting family members from the previous family or something that kind of, I guess, shows them that they're now ready to move on in the present life. Um, so, but yeah, I think those cases are really compelling. So could you could you go into details about the little boy who was shot down in a previous life? Because I'm sure not everyone knows that story. And that, that is such an incredible story that I tell people about it. Sure. And I'll give the short version like uh, like we just heard from your other guests. You know, I could talk about it for half an hour, but I'm going to give you a, a thumbnail sketch of it. All right. Please do. Yeah. And people can look up again. I hope they'll read the book. But anyway, and look it up online or whatever. But his name was James Leininger. He was only he wasn't even two years old when he started 
having these memories. It was literally when he was beginning to talk. And um, he just started in various situations. The first one was that his, the very first thing he said was um, his, well, first of all, his dad took him to a museum where there were all these airplanes. Uh, and he was completely freaked out by the airplanes, and obsessed with them. He didn't want to leave. And his, his father thought that was very strange. Then his mom was pushing him in a stroller by a little toy store. She picked up a toy airplane and she said, she handed it to him and she said, look, James, it, even, it has a bomb underneath it. And it was this plastic airplane. And he said, no, mom, that's not a bomb. That's a drop tank. And she went home and said, what's a drop tank? Asked her husband. And he said, it was this tank that you put on the bottom of an airplane that stores fuel when you have to drive a long distance. Now, there was no way that their child could have known what a drop tank was. He hadn't been exposed to anything that would have taught him that. And so that was just the beginning. And it went on. He started to develop these horrific nightmares where he would absolutely scream in terror and crawl up in a little ball. His dad said it looked like he was trying to break out of a coffin, which I thought was a really eerie way of describing it. Eventually, he started to talk during the dreams, the nightmares, and he would say, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. Over and over again, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. And he was absolutely terrorized, way more than a normal nightmare, as, as his parents described it, and other family members who witnessed it as well. And over a period of time, he was able to provide a, a lot of specific information um, among them was that his name in the previous life was James, that he was shot by the Japanese on the front of his airplane when he was fighting um, in a war. He said he flew a, flew a plane called the Corsair. He flew off of a boat called the Natoma. Again, those two terms are specific, some terms that a two-year-old would not know, a Corsair and a Natoma. And he had a best friend whose name was Jack Larson, and um, he was shot down near the island of Iwo Jima, which he pointed to in a book when he was looking at a book with his dad. Those were all very specific details. And eventually, his father was able to go to some reunions for, from veterans at the, who were flew, flew off the Notoma Bay. And he was eventually able to find a person who matched the descriptions that James gave him. And he, he actually met Jack Larson, who James had said was his friend back in that life, who was still living. And the other interesting component of this is that when James was three, he used to draw, he drew hundreds of drawings of, a, of the plane crash, of this plane being shot down. And he always signed them James 3. And his parents would say, why are you shining them James 3? And he said, because I'm the third James. And they thought he just because he was three years old, they didn't understand that. But it turned out that the person he actually that matched his description that he said he was in that past life was named James Houston Jr. And his dad almost, you know, fainted when he heard that because the junior would mean that little James now was the third James, which is what he had always said. And so it's a long story in terms of how his dad was able to track all this information down and how he was actually able to locate the previous personality, James Houston Jr. And what happened was they found his sister, who was in her 80s at this point, and little James got to meet her. This woman who was in, an, in her 80s now, and she was 24 when James Houston had died in the plane crash. And she was absolutely convinced that little James was her brother because he knew all this stuff about uh, their family life, things about growing up with his sister and all this stuff that, she, he told her that he couldn't possibly have known. So that was a, a really interesting component. And eventually he um, went back to the location of where the crash happened off the coast of, of you know, this island near Iwo Jima. And he had this sort of cathartic experience where he said goodbye to James Houston. And that was sort of the turning point for James Leininger where he kind of moved into his present life and, you know, and is a, now he's 18 years old and an honor roll student, you know, was a, a, a really excellent student and a very accomplished young man. And he's now in the military, having a career in the military. So that's basically the story. There's a lot more details of things he remembered and how the whole thing unfolded that are fascinating. But that gives you the, the case and sort of an overview of the case. He has no memory of where he was between dying and coming back. Well, I mean, he did talk about 
some things that he said happened before he was born, but he didn't really describe the environment, but he did talk about sort of choosing his parents. He said he chose his parents and he described where they were the night that he was conceived, which they were absolutely stunned because they were in a, a pink hotel in Hawaii. That evening they had eaten dinner on the beach and James was able to describe all of that to them. And he'd never, they had never told him about it. He also talked about meeting some of the servicemen in, he-, he called it heaven, in heaven, some of the people who had served with him on the Natoma. And he actually had the names, he named his G.I. Joe dolls, various G.I. Joe dolls. This is really interesting. He had three G.I. Joe dolls, which were really popular with kids, slept with and absolutely adored. And he gave them three different names. They were given to him at different times and they all had a different hair color. So the brown haired one he called Billy, the blonde one was named Leon, and the red haired one was called Walter. And his parents thought that was sort of strange because they didn't, for a kid to have the name Leon and Walter when they were like two or three years old, they thought it was kind of odd. And they asked him where he got the names. And he said, well, these were the people he met in heaven before he was born again. Uh, that these were people that were there in heaven. And his dad looked them up and got the list. When he got the list of the servicemen who had been killed, he found out that each of these names matched someone who had died, who had served with James Houston Jr. and who had died before him. And that they met the actual hair colors corresponded to the names of the people that James had, had given them. But, the, but in terms of, yeah, it's really incredible. But he didn't talk a lot about what life, you know, what his experience was of being in heaven. He just described having met these people in heaven and having witnessed this, seen his parents before he was born as well. Yeah, it was so incredible. I, I don't see how after a story like that, anybody can dispute uh, reincarnation or life after death. So many people fear death. And I think that was inbred in us. And it's just, it's a glorious thing to know that you are just, you are just a spiritual being having a physical experience. Star, what's on your mind? I'm sitting here thinking of past life experiences that I've had in, in the whole kid remembering he was a pilot and brought all that to mind again. So I got a few things we can, I can share if we have time. Sounds really good. And Leslie, thank you for coming on Voices from Afar, and we'll be back. Welcome back, everyone, to Voices from Afar. And tonight we have on board with us Bill Demarest and myself, Star the Oracle, and William White Crow. And our special guest this evening is Leslie Kane, and she has written a book about life after death. The title of the book is Surviving Death, Journalist Investigates Evidence for an Afterlife. Thank you. And we were discussing not only life after death, but we brought up some past life experiences where the little boy is remembering a past life. And and it's weird when you remember a past life and I'm not under hypnosis or anything. So there's always that thing in my brain is going, is this just a really cool imaginary thing? You know, is my brain just going, oh, it's a nice little trip, you know, that's cool. But it's a memory. It's a memory because it has emotion to it and feeling to it and you know what's going to happen and it's it's weird it's not like just watching something when you have all of the emotion with it like the the boy did you know that that lets you know it's something internal right very internal yeah so one of the ones that i had well there's a few i'm gonna do i'm gonna talk about this one i Okay, tell me this. Do do people talk about seeing the whole thing as a scene and knowing it was them and also being in it at the same time? I think that's an interesting question because I think more adults, you know, when adults talk about their memories, they often describe it that way. More than children, I think the children, they're so young, they have no concept of, of what it, what life even is or even death. They don't even know anything. So they're kind of reliving it. And it mm-hmm. seems they're really little there's something unresolved about that life which is probably why it's having such an effect on them but when an adult has a memory i think it's a very different process and maybe i i know some some uh, mediums and people who describe it as seeing it like on a screen yes seeing imagery so i think i think yes i think that's uh, yeah because what i see is it's nighttime 
it's what I can describe it now is it's I think it's about the Civil War time. There's a small cabin. The night's clear. There's a bright, almost full moon overhead. There's a like a split rail fence around the yard. I'm in the yard and I'm saying goodbye to my husband, I guess, and he's dressed in Civil War garb. And right in the tree line, all all the horses, all the men on horses are going past. And he's leaving because they're coming around and he's joining up with them and he's going. And I can hear it. I can smell it. I can feel it. Wow. Everything. You know, the night air, you know, hearing the horses just, they're not going fast. They're just slowly going through the woodland. They're not in big hurries. You know, it, it's... The details, the dress, that the cabin, the, the the fence, the yard, you know, everything. It's it's interesting. It's probably clearer and more vivid than a normal memory, right? It feels yeah. more vivid than just a memory that you might have of something that happened, you know, a few years ago or something like that. Yes. Yeah, I do have a few. There's another one. Take me another few minutes to go through. But it's with a Native American tribe out in the Lakotas. So chime in with something, and then I'll get back to that if we need to. Leslie, during the break, I asked you, did, have you run into anybody that uh, claims they saw the light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I mean, I have talked to people who have had near what they call near-death experiences, um, and they might not always involve seeing a light, but sometimes they do. I've talked to some people, but I've also read a lot about different cases and, and different accounts of people describing what happened to them, I've probably read a lot more about it than I've actually talked to people. Because I'm really interested in as a journalist and sort of knowing what the researchers have come up with, what the most evidential cases are, the ones that, you know, are really hard to refute. An example being if somebody has a, a, a near-death experience in which they meet somebody, say, who they don't even know, like, and then they find out later something about the person. For instance, there was one case where a little girl had a near-death experience. And she came back and told her dad, um, I, I met this boy there who said he was my brother, but she didn't have a brother. And then her dad told her, well, actually, she did have a brother who died before she was born. And no, one, they had never told her about it. So things like that, you know, those are sort of research cases in which there's something there that's very evidential that suggests... She wasn't just making something up in her brain. She actually had some kind of experience in which some something happened that she couldn't have known about. You know, where you, where you meet someone that, that um, you didn't even know had died or you didn't even know existed. And that's also what happened to Eben Alexander in his famous book, Proof of Heaven, which maybe some of you have read or your listeners have read, in which he, he met this, this girl when he was in this other realm who turned out to have been I think his biological sister who he never met or, or an adopted sister or somebody from his family that he didn't even know or didn't know existed. And he only found out afterwards. So those kinds of cases really intrigued me particularly. So what is, what is your journalism background? Do you? I'm an investigative reporter. And in the 90s, I worked for I did a lot of freelance writing. And then I, um, I was also working for a public radio station in California, hosting a daily investigative news show and covering a lot of different kinds of political stories and human rights issues and a lot of different just stories that you might hear. And it was a progressive, very progressive radio station. And then what happened was I got very interested in the UFO subject based on a report that I was given in about 1999, I guess was when I wrote my, and I started reporting on the UFO topic, but from a very serious journalistic perspective, you know, and over the, and then in, in 20, that all culminated, I spent about 10 years investigating that topic. And in 2010, I published my, my book about UFOs called UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. Um, and that sort of was the culmination of a lot of research I had done, which involved speaking with very high-level government officials and, you know, government people around the world who had investigated the phenomenon and using official documentation and radar data and stuff like that to really show that there is something real there. And to explore why it is that the U.S. government seems to not want to acknowledge it. And so that was a real focus of mine. But I, I, I maintained my journalistic perspective, but I was really focused primarily on that, that issue for many years. And then after that, 
I had also been interested in this, these kinds of cases as well, involving uh, the question of survival past death. And after my UFO book came out, I had more time to focus on this topic. And so that's what led to the new book that just came out. My dear, where are you going when you leave, Leslie? Hmm. You're talking to me. Where am I going? What you, when, tell me what you mean by that question. Uh, when you leave this body, where are you headed? I wish I knew, Bill. You, what, you, maybe you can tell me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's an individual uh, journey. You know, uh, everybody is going to, their journey is going to be what it is. You know, yeah. none of us can really predict what that's going to be. We, we may have a feeling, you know, because of the indications that science has proven, you know, like you're talking about, Leslie, the existence of, uh, of life after, after death. It's just a transition anyway, you know. So, but each person's journey is, is an individual journey. It'll, they'll all be different. I, there is, I've had this happen twice, Leslie, so maybe this will help answer that question. Maybe it won't at all. This was an experience I had in, in my own backyard. I had visitors come to the house. I decided not to smoke my cigarette in the house. My mother-in-law at the time didn't like it. I said, fine, I'll go out in the backyard. I went out in the backyard. I am 10 feet from my back door, looking up at the stars. I'm, you know, it's a nice evening, and I start bawling. My heart is wrenching. I am homesick. I am literally beside myself. I am just so overwhelmed with this homesick feeling, and there's part of me that's doing this, having all this, and there's a, the other side of me that's going, what's going on? I want to go home. <laughs> You're in your own backyard, sweetie. This is a home. Where's home? Home's up there. I'm having this whole conversation with myself in my backyard. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I've told William about this before, but yeah so oh, yeah. where is home and it's up it's up there so am i from another planet and i get to go back home after this i don't know mm -hmm. uh, but i do know that mm -hmm. there was another time that somebody had asked me how old i was and without thought it was just instinct came straight out of my mouth in earth years where does that come from where does that come from <laughs> <laughs> i, st I yes, asked myself yeah. immediately where does that come from so yep. you know, we are not limited to our to our physical bodies. We are temporarily not, here using our physical bodies. Yes, William. Yeah, we're not uh, we're not attached to any one thing. This is where we need to be at at this time. You know, mm -hmm. and my perspective and your perspective is really close there. You know, because I've done the same thing. You know, I've walked right outside <laughs> on my porch. You know, and I've looked up in the sky and it's. Fed up with the world and everything, you know, and even though I'm helping a lot of people, you know, at the same time, and I go, you could come and get me anytime, anytime. Oh, I say that about you know? any day, every day. <laughs> I say that. Oh, yeah, you know, but it's a feeling of that connection with something that isn't from here. Yes. You know, that's the interesting thing, not this dimension, this time, space. Uh, it's, it's a good memory. It's a good feeling. Uh, so it must be very good to, to have that pull on us, I would imagine. Leslie, the reason I ask that is um, there's no doubt in my mind that after this life, I have a starship, and it's Starship Starvexer, and it's a comedy club. And all I wanted to do was when you get, you know, life is eternal, sometime in the eternal, I would like you to stop by Starvexer's comedy club, where <laughs> you have the opportunity to laugh at yourself in this life. And you become a star. All right. I'll try and remember that. Yeah. So we got to start the after bucket list. So after this life, we have a bucket list of the things we need to do. One of them is stop by Starvexer and the comedy club. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, an that's, when the, that's when the adventure begins. I have a question uh, for you, Leslie. It happened to me. Um, <laughs> we had lost a child and everything. My wife and I at about 19 months old in an accident. You know, I went out in the woods, and of course, me being my belief of spirit and everything, I had an argument, you know, with the great spirit, shall we say. Right. You know, just give us one more chance. You know, give us one more chance. A year later, uh, our daughter, Crystal, was born. Right. When she was growing up, and she started drawing pictures, which she started quite early. She would draw the sun and, and the stick figures playing in the yard. And then she had draw, colored the whole picture a light blue over the blue. After, you know, 10 15 pictures like this she started wondering what is this you know what is, so we asked her and she goes it's water well our son zachariah died in a drowning accident 
And it was just, just like a, a solid brick hitting you on your head. She's drawing a picture of the sun and all the pictures and everything are there. And her little brother standing there from underwater. Wow, that's so interesting. Oh, wow. Did she say anything yeah. more about, about that made you think there was a connection there? Oh, she said she indicated that that was, that was her. That's what she's seen, you know, and that's what happened to her. We never told her until she was like, you know, five or six about her little brother, you know, right. passing away that way. So she was drawing these pictures all up to this time. So it's just amazing. That is really wonderful. It shows her that either, yeah, that she's obviously very connected to him. If she was not, maybe she was his reincarnation. Who knows? But if not. Exactly. Really exactly. I think that's what I think, the reincarnation, drawing you know, the pictures, uh, the knowing, and, and swims like a fish now. Loves so the water. So she's not, know, it's, it's any really, phobia. You know, phobias, because lots of times these children that drown, when they're reborn, they have phobias about water. But it could work the Yeah, she did, it, she did in the beginning just a little bit. And then I told, uh, you know, I go by the spirit, how it kind of pushes me and feeling my wife do. Very, we're both very similar in that. And I said, put her in the water, start teaching her to swim. And before you knew it, it wasn't a fear anymore. It was, let's go swimming. Yeah, and if there was anything with water in it, you know, she would she would jump in it and want to go swimming. That's so great. Yeah. Well, maybe that was some comfort. Yeah, we could. Life. I don't know. Well, I think she had other things to do here, experiences, and, and accidents do happen. You know, uh, there are some things that I think are faithful and some that aren't. You know, it's uh, the flux of time, space, I guess you could say. Whatever it is, it, it uh, sure put us on a different track, too. The death of a child and then what seemed to be that spirit coming back into this existence in the same family. It's very yeah. interesting. Very interesting, yeah. And it must have been, uh, made his maybe made the death a little bit easier. I don't know if that's appropriate to say or not. but Nothing uh, makes a death easier. What it, what it does is turn around and, and gives you hope for the next, is this the one? You know, if you have another one right. in many cases. Right, yeah. Absolutely incredible. Go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, I was gonna say, there was a another. I guess here's another evidence for life after death, and I'm gonna give the short version. I'm not gonna go through the story again. So just Leslie, for for you, you're getting the abbreviated version. Okay. When my, my daughter just turned 27, she put a 41 round and 48 or a 458, and all the gun put it to her chin, pulled the trigger. So. When all this was going on, like the the next night, I was I was in bed. I'm not going to sleep. All the lights were off, and I'm asking God, okay, where's the bullet? Because the bullet was not in her. It was not in the room. It was not in the gun. It was not anywhere. And Papa Hutchcraft, who was a previous owner of that elephant gun that got handed down to my ex-husband, my daughter's dad, Papa Hutchcraft was standing at the foot of my bed, grinning from ear to ear. He held out his, he opened his hand, he opened up his hand, and in that hand was the bullet, the round, and he winked, and he vanished. So that answered my question, because I was asking God, you know, where's the bullet? Because obviously, if she put the bullet in the gun, and it's not in her head, and her head's not on my attic ceiling, or anywhere else around the house, because she survived. Miraculously, she survived. She got whiplash, and she still has a little bit of gunpowder in her chin. That's it. Oh, wow. That's, That's it. So, Papa Hutchcraft came back. I mean, appeared. So he's somewhere or else, you know, if that was a demon that appeared, then he was very nice and kind. If that was an angel that appeared, then that was really cool. I mean, if that was Papa that appeared, then high five, dude. Thank you. And, you know, whatever. So, yeah, I agree. All right. Whoever it was, you got the answer you wanted. Exactly. I just happened to look like the guy that had the gun, you know, in, in the lifetime. So, yeah. That's have, you a, have you had a near death experience, Wesley? No, I, I haven't. I mean, I've had some experiences in, that I write about in the book involving um, some great medium re mediumship readings with a mental medium. And then I had some after-death communications from my brother who died in 2013 during the time I was writing the book, actually, researching it. And then I had some experiences oh, wow. sitting with some physical medium, a physical medium in um, England, which was really amazing. So, but I've, oh. never, I've never had a near-death experience, no thing to research. I think it's, uh, you know, people need to really look a little further than where we're at today. I mean, that's, uh, I think it, it would make a life a lot easier for people, I think. Yeah, I think it does. If you, if you 
feel that there's going to be something after you die, I think it really changes your your life. Your your mm -hmm. your perception of life here on earth when you have that awareness. It it makes it easier to live without fear. You know, mm -hmm. we have yeah. uh, the alphabet agencies and you know, uh, I am a domestic terrorist and I've told them, you know, you can off me anytime you want because I'm going to be coming back at you from the other side and from uh what I've talked to other people about, the, the problem with these agencies is they cannot conceive how a person doesn't fear death and goes on to a spiritual higher existence because they're so wrapped up in this 3D existence, correct? Yeah, I, would, I think that's probably true, yeah. So you are a fearless lady? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, I, as far as I'm aware, but you know, if I was confronted with my own death, I don't know how I would react. But as far as I can, you know, consciously say in the moment when everything's fine and I'm not being threatened by anything, uh, I can, all these things have really affected me in a very positive way, but I can't, you never know how you're going to react when that moment comes. At least I feel if I'm honest with myself. Yeah. You should start relaxing and look forward to it after all the uh, research <laughs> you've done. I know. Yeah, well, you I'm, know not, that I'm not ready for that to happen yet. <laughs> <laughs> the unknown is what is the only fear when it comes to the death. You know, when you have an experience that, you know, how am I going to react? You know, because that's a transition you just don't want to go through, you know, in, in many ways. So, yeah, I can understand that. She's 100% right. If you haven't experienced it, you're... You don't know how you're going to deal with it when it happens. And you've, you know, you've had the experience of, of dying and coming back. Mm -hmm. So you're in a very different situation. Yeah. And I, I kind of appreciate that. Because I've experienced, you know, of course, other people dying in combat and, and, you know, my son and other family members and friends having that aspect of experience in myself. It, it's almost like you smile and you say, ah. You know, journey on, my friend. Mm -hmm. Now, now the journey begins. You know, it's uh, you're not worried for them anymore. You know, I guess yeah, that's the best way to put it. Right. It's good fortune in a way, even though your accident was horrible. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Yeah. But you know, for somebody to have that experience and then be able to come back certainly is a a wonderful thing and will improve their lives. I'm sure. You know, once they yeah, I've, I've I, I've cussed it myself a few times you know but then because you you know you're still connected with the other side actually you know so you feel things and know things ahead of time in a lot of in a lot of ways so but i learned you know you live with it and and you help other people with it you know i want to say listen this is i know something that can help you uh, mm -hmm. because you can start feeling other people's energies and and how to work with them really that's a, a big uh plus right right well, that's, that's a wonderful thing a wonderful gift you can give to people and Leslie, any of the cases you've studied, these people come back with what you might call any superpowers or divination or anything of that intensity? Um, I think sometimes when you have, I mean, what I've read is that sometimes the people that have near-death experiences, it does open up sort of psychic abilities in them that they didn't have before. So they become more yeah. sensitive on that level. I don't think it always happens, but sometimes it happens. And with these children, um, you know, I, I know what the, the other little boy I write about, Ryan Hammonds, was very, uh, he's, he was quite psychic as a, as a child. You know, he was able to foresee the future and could figure out, you know, when someone in his family was sick, he knew what was wrong with them, those kinds of things. I think most, but James Leininger didn't have any of those capabilities. So I guess it's different in every case. Um, but I, I have read that sometimes that door is opened up in people when they come back and they'll start to have more of those kinds of experiences after a near death experience. I agree. Yeah. Um, oh, I have a question if we have time. Um, Leslie, I want to know because of my own curiosity here, maybe you can research it, but those that come back, are they, when they are like born under an Aries and they die and they come back, you know, a few minutes later, whenever that time is and say it's, you know, another sign like Capricorn or Libra. I want, I'm curious to know if that affects them at all. Wow, that's such an interesting question, Star. I've never had that question before, and I'm not an astrologer, so that would be a great question to ask an astrologer. But I'm assuming that their birth sign is really the one that holds, because they, they haven't died completely, or they wouldn't be coming back. 
Right. But I just I have to wonder if there's some sort of a like an operational reset. You yeah, know, that's things. such an interesting question. Absolutely. I could I have no idea. I'm in no way qualified to answer that question. Okay, we'll, we're going to be back in about three minutes, and I brought uh, Jonathan in with us because I kind of left him out. Uh, I left the wingman out in the wings. And Leslie, we were discussing um, mediumship and uh, talking to those on the other side. Uh, that piqued your interest, huh? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've i always been curious about it, but skeptical, you know, and so so I had the opportunity while I was researching my book to uh, do readings with some two really, really accomplished mediums who didn't know anything about me or who I was. And one of them was on the phone and one of them was on Skype. Uh, and I write about in the book just the incredibly specific details that seem to be coming through to people I was close to who had died within recent years. Uh, and it was just so striking to me how specific the information was. You know, it's nothing, it's one thing if they bring through very general information that can apply to a lot of people, but when they bring through very, very specific information that also information that's personal that nobody else would know about or maybe just a couple of people would know about, it's very compelling. And I, I did have the good fortune of um, having two readings like that with mental mediums which I do write about in the book, um, and very, very compelling. They're either uh, talking to the deceased people that they say they are talking to, or and bringing messages through to you, the sitter, or the other way of explaining it that a lot of people theorize about is that the mediums are using their own psychic abilities, their own telepathy and clairvoyance, to access the information themselves through the mind of the sitter or other people that they have access to through telepathy, and then maybe they're actually not communicating with dead people. That's the other argument that people will provide, and which I do discuss in my book, and you can't really prove one or the other, but when you're sitting there and having a reading, it doesn't, it certainly feels like the people are present, the dead people, the your deceased loved ones, and, and they're also personality traits that come through uh, and all kinds of subtle things like that, that are, are not just uh, that are, you know, you have to be, have the experience to really understand. Yeah. I had a comment to that. And yes, Please. let me introduce Jonathan. Uh, he wanted in on this conversation because he's very much in touch with the subject. Go ahead, John. I was really eager. Um, I don't like to call myself a medium, except that I've had the experiences for many years and um, when I've had psychic experiences as opposed to mediumship, as opposed to clairvoyance or anything else, if I can explain this to you, because you, you've obviously done the research, so you've seen a wide variety of, of the way people have interpreted it, including your own analysis and research. When, when spirits have come through, I hate to use the word possession, but they do say sometimes you should always question wh where that spirit's from, what its source is, and so on. That's up to the observer or the, where a person is spiritually for themselves. If they're atheist or agnostic, how can they pose that question? They're taking it, you know, with, with an analytical mind. But where the, when a sphere comes through, um, especially deceased members, they come through in full living color, like full expression, details that have knowledge that I should have no knowledge of. Whereas when I've used psychic abilities, it's been more like, um, I always say it's like almost like radar, like you're pinging the information and kind of like going on what comes back stronger. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, what that's fascinating, uh, Jonathan, because what, one of the, the ways I researched this was I asked the mediums themselves, you know, and like you're saying, they can tell the difference between when they are bringing through psychic information and when they are bringing through what we call mediumistic information or information that is coming from the connection with this deceased person. And they, they say there's a very distinct difference, just like you described. Yeah. They're aware of this. And I, I, my, my point is, you know, why not accept that? Why not accept that these mediums who have been doing this for decades have developed the capacity to make that discernment? And I don't see any reason to second guess them and say, oh, it's all psychic. You don't know what you're talking about, which is what, you know, some of the people will theorize that maybe they're just deceiving themselves. But they're very clear that they're, they're two different processes, just like you described. Right. And if you wanted to go in the physical sense, I mean, I've even noticed physiologically, um, there is a change in perception or what part of the body is being accessed where I felt it on myself energetically or even mentally. So I've come to over the years, write my own notes so that I can map it out for other people. 
so that they can then, I guess, learn, you know, when they say learn ESP, like, you know, buy this book for a quarter in the back of the comic book section, something like that. <laughs> and so, you know, who's, who's to say it's just like, it's like breathing, uh, you, you change your breathing technique and you can elicit different states of, uh, reality, right? Rapid breathing. You can do Wuchi breathing. You can do anaerobic, aerobic. It's going to elicit all different states in the body. And so I think the psychic realm, or if you want to say psychic, it's all psychic. It's all different aspects of psychic, but again, how you access it through what, what I noticed again, when I've, when I've met maybe for, I hate to say dead people cause they're not dead. They're just not in the physical form. I, know, I, don't, I never know what word to use either for that. For that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some people call I them agree. Discarnates. Call them what? Discarnates. Discarnates. Yeah. Like I was telling you though, on break, the most fascinating experience, I've had two of them. Most fascinating experience is one, a guy who had passed away as a friend of a friend, dear friend. And I didn't even know this man, even casually. I only knew of him through this friend. Mm -hmm. She told me she was going to his funeral that Thursday. That Tuesday, I was at work, and he comes down through the ceiling. I'm at the printer. I'll never forget this. And he swoops down into my face. I, knew, I didn't even know what this guy looked like. And he says, I want you to go to this funeral and take care of my family, my sister. And he shows me an image. I tell my friend, and she says, that would be great. I didn't know who I was going to drive with. I'm not going to be you know, steady with my nerves. I said, okay. I go there. There he is in the casket, the guy I saw, and I'm freaking out now because this oh, is like wow. – I was only 22 at the time. Wow. What really amazed me though, there's his sister just like he showed me and his mother and all that. Now, I sat in the back and I was getting really strong hits off this family because obviously we made a connection. Mm -hmm. and my friend says, are you all right? I said, yeah. I said, but his grandmother's standing um, – he's standing right next to his grandmother over there. I didn't know who his grandmother was, but he goes, that's funny. That's where she's sitting. So she goes and tells her and she says at that moment when they, they started laughing, the flowers jumped off the pedestal and at their feet – and she comes back and tells me this. I said, uh, you know, I'm at a loss. I just know what I've seen. So when you have these experiences, I don't know how the other mediums explain it to you, but when there's no stimulus or input and there's no other way of knowing, it's hard to take it onto yourself and say it's a skill that you have, like an ego, saying, oh, I'm a great artist or I'm a great dancer. <laughs> there really is no rhyme or reason or switch yeah. to turn it on or off. For some reason, they see an in with you. It's almost like Whoopi Goldberg. As soon as they figured out she could read, everybody was looking to jump in her body and take a chance. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I mean, what you're saying makes complete sense to me. I think it's the people who have not had the experiences themselves that are an analytical and sort of looking at this from a theoretical perspective that will go with the hypothesis that maybe they're just, um, you know, that these mediums are just using their own psychic. I mean, it's just purely theoretical. I think most of those people have not necessarily had these experiences themselves with mediums. Well, you see, and I've, and I've never been the I've never been the kind of hang a sign and say I'm a medium. That's the difference. I've tried to be skeptical and analytical, and yeah. see this mm -hmm. so that I could. Um, so it does include more people and not be so limiting and myopic. I find that any group that I've ever seen tends to do that. People get very uh, pigeonholed into that group, and then a certain set of rules, and yeah. you got to do it this way. And I'm not like that. I'm like, well, the world wasn't created that way, and there's too many people that are having. That's the other thing too. Too many people have had shared experiences or had experiences of either seeing their loved ones in passing, regardless of their religion, walk of life, life experience. There's too many commonalities in this. And I think we touched on this last time when we talked about spirituality, because when you tell people you're a psychic, no matter what their walk of life is, a lot of times they'll come back and say, what do you get on me? What do you pick up on? So there is a fascination that's built into us with, with this life after death idea. Absolutely. I, you know, agree. I, I think, yeah, I agree. I have a little question for you here. Um, after my experience, and I agree with uh, what Jonathan's saying there, you know, I, I mean, my experiences are very similar. And uh, but as I say, we all approach things in energetically, you know, so we, we are feeling. But my ability after I came back from my, I call it near life experience, actually, because it just opens a, a whole new reality up to you about life, is when I, somebody, I got people that always come to me and they'll say, they'll hand me an envelope. It was with something in it and they'll say you know tell me about this and one time it was a check and i said well it's going to bounce you know my ability to also uh feel basically and i felt that it wasn't didn't it just that's the first words that came to my mind but i described the person that gave it to him as well so uh this is one ability that's kind of definitely come into being since that experience i had it a little bit but not to the extent i have it now it's like if i want to know something somebody's picked a magazine up laid it down on the counter and i walk over and pick up that magazine i'll pick up their energies uh, right off the top mm -hmm. have you had that experience before with any of your no, wait people? wait wait do you wear do you wear a hat like the great karnak <laughs> no huh? it's tinfoil okay. <laughs> uh, you have to have a good sense of humor and 
this in this thing too. But I, I, there's a lot of people out there that I've ran into you know, that I've gotten older. I'm 63 now that uh, they don't like to admit it, but that's what they do. They'll pick something up as somebody's and feel the energy to see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm empathic. And I had early on in my awakening, feeling these energies more as an adult experience. I went to work one day and at that point I kind of knew I was empathic, but I didn't know what I know now about the whole thing. And I've learned a lot since then with experiences. Also, I went to work one day and I was, I was like confused. And then I was really, really mad. And I, I knew this was not for me. And then I was incredibly sad and I went through all these steps of mourning. So I, I go home and I'm trying to figure this out because at the same time, I'm starting to see these three boys. I'm seeing these three teenage boys. And every time I see them, there's two walking towards me and one walking the other way down the road. So I go to work that day and I find out, or was the next day? It was, I just been like 15 years ago. So I find out that there was an accident where there were, there were three boys in this accident and it was not far from where we lived. And so I, that evening, the next evening I go home and I'm calling my friend. I'm like, you got to help me deal with all this energy because Leslie, I was not only going through all those emotions, I was seeing these kids. And then once I found out what happened, these boys were talking to me. They were like, mm. you've got to get in touch with my mom. Please tell my mom I'm sorry. Tell her I love her. Tell her, uh-huh. you know, these, yeah. even now, you can, and it's tearing me up now because I can still see these kids standing in front of me. Right. But I found out that two lived, or two died, and one lived. And well. that's why I was seeing two walking one way and one walking. But I did go out to that wreck, and half of their vehicle was wrapped around a tree on this side of the road. And 300 feet up the road, the other half of the vehicle was wrapped around oh. another tree. Oh, my God. It did was you, bad. Did you contact their mothers? I never did. I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know who. I didn't know what to do. Yeah, you, you don't know? know if the mothers take kindly to it or not. That's the problem. You never know how they're going to react. Exactly. I mean, I have had things where I've gone up to people and, and tell them, and you don't always get a good reaction when oh. you're trying to give somebody a heads up about something. So... I mean, yeah. especially right away, I think if you were going to do something like that, you'd want to wait maybe, you know, six months or something after the after it happens and sort of give the family time to deal with it before offering right. it like that. And then you could offer it to them and they could either accept it or not. But, well, I mean, that's up to you. It's up to you. But and that's how I put most of the stuff forth. I'm like, here it is. You know, you all can take it or leave it. I'm just going to put it out there. You know, so no, can I, I have a question for Leslie, though. I didn't catch the whole beginning of the show. Was your is your uh, specialty or your focus on this book specifically on um, afterlife and mediumship, or was well, it all aspects of psychic it's phenomena? Sort of a broad range of of evidence for survival path deaths that I've I've brought into one book. So I've gone to a lot of different research areas and just mm-hmm. journalistically looked at what the most evidential material is. You know, from a from a pretty intellectual standpoint, but it's very readable. But um. You know, case histories of children that remember past lives and that have been verified and uh, memories between lives and, and um, you know, a lot of stuff on some stuff on near death experiences and after death communications and apparitions and physical mediumship, mental, a whole lot of different things, basically. And then I kind of draw them into one book and I show how they all kind of interconnect and how they all point towards the same reality, basically. So by the end of, by the time you get to the end of the book, you've kind of been walked through from the sort of easier things, the things that are easier to accept initially. And then I kind of gradually uh, walk people through one area and then that leads to another area. And then questions come up from that one and then that leads you to the next one. And so by the time you get to the ones that might be the harder to accept, um, you've kind of had, you've done the background that lets you get there and lets you be able to accept it. So that was, so it was very careful in how I put it all together. So there would be a progression, but it comes from a lot of different areas of investigation. Well, I'm definitely going to check out your book because I'm looking on Amazon right now. And you also did one on UFOs too. So, yeah. so that was the yeah. one I spent a lot of time on before I did this one. Yeah. So I'm very interested in topics that sort of expand our sense of what lies behind the physical world. And, Maybe I can give know, you the, some info for your third book. Great. <laughs> Yeah, great. 
Um, but I mean, you know, it's very journalistic. It's a, it's a good book to give to somebody who doesn't quite accept this stuff and just needs a little more proof. You know, they need a little more solid evidence and they might want to accept it, but they just don't. And this is the kind of book that you can give to somebody who's skeptical. And it's because everything in it's very factual, it's documented, it's researched. And there are scientists and, and medical doctors and psychiatrists that have written chapters in the book. I've actually invited 10 other people to write, contribute chapters. And some of them are real experts in their field. And you read these things and you just can't walk away and say, well, it's impossible that we survive death. There's no way you could come to that conclusion. And so it's a very good book to give to friends or people who have doubts about it. Can I add one thing about time? Have you? I don't know if you encountered this with researching, uh, if any of the people that you researched... I know like when given readings, as opposed to, again, when a, when a phenomena happens, like when you see a ghost or you see a spirit leave the body, or I even seen my son enter the body when my wife and him, uh, I conceived him, came right down through the ceiling into her navel. It was just like a little orange ember on a beam of light. It was amazing. Yeah. First and only time I saw that. But those are phenomena that presented itself, whereas psychic phenomena or let's say finding missing children or doing a reading for somebody, I find a time gets skewed. And sometimes in the events yeah. that you're trying to pinpoint, and I've had people come back to me, this happens frequently, a year and a half later, they'll call me up out of the blue, hi, Jonathan, this is so-and-so, okay? Are you a bill collector? You know, it's like, I don't know who <laughs> you are. And they're like, do you remember you gave me a reading a year and a half ago? I'm like, no, give me a little more to go on. And so they'll tell me, they said, everything you said came true. But it mm -hmm. happened at the time, and, and I've had people that were in denial, I've had people tell me, I don't have an Uncle Frank, you name it. Yeah. But whatever their let's say somebody I guess isn't focused towards phenomenological experiences. They may be a mm -hmm. little slow on the uptake. They may be a little unaware and it takes longer for it to saturate through to them. I don't know. But as a psychic, when they want to know these things, and they ask you, am I going to find true lover? It's so hard to pinpoint because there's too many events that are happening and it's happening in a nonlinear fashion. You right. know what I'm saying? It's, it, it, and, yeah. and it, it's part of their experience. So how, sense, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, that it would be nonlinear. And I, I know that sometimes in readings that I've had, like they'll say uh, something's going to happen and then, or something is happening. And then if I say, well, no, that doesn't really ring true. They'll say, well, then it, it'll be down the road. It'll happen later. They can't necessarily always pinpoint the moment in time right. when things are going to occur. Things are often event driven rather than time driven. Like, yes, this event's going to happen, but this has to happen first. Mm -hmm. Or whenever this person gets to this stage in their life, then yes, this is going to happen. Because the spirit, time is only like how, how we regulate our, our matrix illusion, I think. Because if you go to where you start living, not you know, by the clock, you, you go, you get in, you, William, you know this, there's a whole flow. There's just a flow how things yeah. go. And I'm experiencing this because yeah. I've gone back to work this week and my whole rhythm of everything is just off. But there's a side note. Um, But yeah, everything in the spiritual realm, even, you know, like prophecies or anything. And I even the readings that I hear, you know, they say the, the remind us it. Things of the spiritual realm are event driven. Things of our our higher purpose in nature on this life, on this planet now, are event driven. You know, yes, things are going to happen as above, so below. But is, is, you can't go by a clock or a calendar or a year, you know, or even an an age sometimes. So, I was going to say, I think there's another component to it, though. I think whenever we disconnect from this linear timeline that we're attached to. Right. Um, like when you're doing something pleasurable, time goes fast. You're doing something with drudgery like at work. It might take forever. Mm -hmm. But when we go into an experience, whether it's like a, a ayahuasca trip or even just going to, in a dream state or drumming or anything we do, maybe our spiritual body knows that we only have a limited time to to That's be right. in that window, almost like the movie Avatar. Right. When they were inhabiting those secondary bodies. And it takes advantage of that time and compresses it. Or it, again, it's not attached to this linear scale that we're in this physical realm. And so the experience could seem like, wow, it was so vivid, it was so lucid, it felt like it was hours and it was only people watching you say, no, you're only under for like 30 minutes. If I could just say one last thing, the biggest yeah. disappointment, I've never taken the readings or anything personal because I never put it out for my own ego. I tried okay. finding okay. missing yeah. children once and mm. I went out one night and I was so clear, spirit showed me on a map where they would be. I showed up and unfortunately I got there an hour before they did. 
They wound up at the same Dunkin' Donuts, the same thing. And I was so disappointed in myself. It was 1.30 in the morning. And finally I said, I'm going to just go home. I, I tried my best. I get a, a call from a friend on Facebook. They said they found him. I said, where? They said, the Dunkin' Donuts on Route. And I was like, wait a minute. I was there. Uh-huh. So like Spirit was showing me the right place. But had I stayed there longer, you know, my, right. my egotistical mind was thinking, no, this is stupid. Like I, I didn't believe in myself. I was like, this is stupid. Why am I waiting here? Had well, these three kids showed you, up. You didn't know how long it would take, right? That's just it. I did. This is the first time I ever tried finding missing kids, and I just did it on a lark because it was a good friend of mine, and they were so scared. I said, "I can do this." Like something in me said, "You can do this," mm-hmm. and I went to do it. But again, if I just sat there, if three kids, twelve, nine, and, and ten, show up at one thirty in the morning, you know, two thirty in the morning, that was obviously that. Right. <laughs> I mean, my trajectory right, was right. right. You know, everything was right, but uh, my timing was off. And so after that, That's I never the- gave it another try. I hope you will again give it another try. It sounds like you have a real ability there. Perhaps, but again, like the problem with phenomena is, you know, it's like you don't always know what triggers it. And then if you do trigger it, then you're prone to more phenomena. And then there's a couple ability to it, if that makes sense. I don't know if I necessarily want that attachment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Very understandable. Well, I also think when people have near death experiences, I mean, you can you can speak to this, William. I bet that um, your sense of time is completely different when you're in that other realm. <laughs> yeah, you said you were there dead. is no time. Yeah, and I bet you felt like. If you had to reflect on it when you came back, I bet it felt like it was way longer than that. Oh, well, much longer, much longer. It felt like I would was there for hours upon hours, you know, and yeah. uh, it was only five to ten minutes. It, when you're in that other connected state, uh, time is very different. Mm-hmm, very much so. But I, I've learned Indian time, as we call it since then, <laughs> you know, and, and that's what we, we do things when it's necessary to do. You know, we I go by a totally different concept of time now because of what you're saying there your whole concept of this reality is blown when you when you're on the other side you know that there's really no limitations if you get your your energy right your mind right your your soul you know everything combined in a balance you can you can there's a massive amount of things you can do we look at it telepathy everything is a soul is natural we just have to attune ourselves to it we are on a timeline and we have about a minute and a half before we go to another break and uh if we're going to let leslie go i want to thank leslie so very much for for coming on voices from afar tonight well thank you for having me i greatly enjoyed and i learned a lot from uh your three all four of you i learned a lot from you i really appreciate that figured you might uh, write another book about uh this show anyway just joking (laughs) (laughs) leslie Leslie, really it's been a real pleasure it's been a pleasure it really has and um, again, the book is called Surviving Death, A Journalist Investigates Evidence for an Afterlife. And if anybody wants to communicate with me, my Facebook page is very active and I, I'd love to hear from people there. So um, I hope people will check out the book and maybe we can communicate more about it. And thanks again for having me on. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for the chance. All of you, take care and keep up the you great betcha. work that you're all doing. I, I think have it's wonderful. Evening. Thank you, Leslie, and I have you on Skype now, so we may have a chat now and then, but I won't become a pest. So. <laughs> oh, I will. Give me her, give me her thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to speak with you. Nice to talk to you folks. Have a good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And we'll see you next Monday, and thank you, William. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Sarah, yes, so very much. Yeah. It was such a great show. And we love you all.